Hi, I'm Abraham. I have the distinct honor of being the last talk today. Um, <clears throat> my slide is orange, but I'm not from Criteo. Amazon's colors are also orange, so don't forget. Um, but actually, I'm from A9, which is an Amazon subsidiary. Um, long story. So we've talked a lot about conversion funnels and the attribution and all sorts of very interesting things in advertising. And I'm going to do it again. Um, so here is a big picture of the conversion funnel. Imagine this in 3D, like going like that. Um, out of the millions of ad requests it takes, a few of them turn into impressions, and then even few of them turn into clicks. And once in a while, people actually buy stuff. And um, you know, that's great. So just keep in mind that these conversion funnels are everywhere, even though they're incredibly unlikely. Um, so let's take a look at some of them. We've seen lots of different examples of conversions today. Uh, one of them that you may be familiar with is sponsored search. So supposing that you are very interested in getting a credit card, you might do a search to get a credit card because you might not have any credit cards. Um, so you type in some queries and then you click on an ad, you see the advertiser's page, you sign up for something and out pops a credit card and that's called the conversion. And so what's nice about sponsored search is there's this direct intent that essentially you're telling whatever it is that you want. Um, you also get lots of different ads per slot. And um, you know the thing about conversion here is this is just one objective. You're either going to convert and get the credit card or you're not, but it varies by advertiser. And um, another example we've seen is in performance display, where instead of a search page, you're on any other page on the internet and you see some sort of an ad. Maybe you click on the ad, you go to an advertiser's page and you get another credit card. And this is an example of inferred intent because now you haven't exactly told us what you're looking for, but we're guessing that given that you are reading some news and you know, you're doing other stuff. Um, but again, it's pretty much the same funnel and um, that's not part of my talk. So that's why it says not this talk. Um, another example of a conversion funnel is Amazon sponsored products. So if those of you who are familiar with Amazon may see some ads, um, you might have a hard time finding them because they look just like all the regular um, displays of products on Amazon, but it's there if you look closely. So, so suppose you have an idea of something you want to buy, like it's a birthday coming up and you want to buy a present for someone who maybe wants a teddy bear. So you search for a teddy bear and you'll see some ads. You could click on the ads, then you will see the Amazon detail page. And when you buy something, you get an Amazon box, which comes with the conversion inside. It's a teddy bear. And that's called the purchase. And so that's another example of a conversion funnel that in Amazon we call the purchase funnel. Now, the difference between this and the other ones is that it's a lot more like search here. There's a direct intent. You have lots of ads, but there's a single sale. This isn't uh, advertiser specific. Um, it, it's generally designed to sell something very specific, although it may be for one particular merchant. So finally, we come to what it is we'll be talking about today, which is an extension of this to what's called native shopping ads, which is a program for Amazon uh, associates. So this is for non-Amazon properties, any other publisher who has content. So let's say you went to Google and you typed in, I want to find the best teddy bears. I did that and I found this page that lists all the amazing teddy bears that you can find on Amazon and it has a wonderful description and at the bottom of there are these wonderful ads which are supposedly relevant to the content um, so it's a little bit closer to the purchase uh, intent but still it's based on inference and when you click on it again you go to the detail page and you can buy it. The difference here is that in a sense Amazon is going to pay to the publisher for all the purchases that you would make after clicking. So this represents a very interesting attribution challenge for those of us interested in attribution. Um, this I call the purchase halo. Um, so not only would you click on the teddy bear, you might realize that you're having a birthday party and you forgot the candles. So you're gonna throw in the candles and then later you realize you don't have the cake. So you're gonna have to make the cake. So you buy cake mix. And now you have two boxes coming to your house with uh, conversions inside. So this is another example of our purchase funnel. Um, and so the problem we're trying to solve here is how do we actually do um, uh, 
conversion prediction where the conversions could be multiple purchases. And sometimes a click might be totally useful even if it doesn't lead directly to a purchase because it goes to our favorite retailer that ultimately may drive a purchase in some other way. Um, so we can state this a little more in detail by saying essentially we have as input, there is a user, he's on a publisher's page, he's looking at a list of ads, and we're going to turn that into an amazing set of very interesting features. And what we'd like to do is to come up with some sort of a ranking function that will return five to 10 ads from Amazon's vast catalog of possible products to show to someone, ranked by a single scoring function. The objective of which is to maximize our total expected value. And we're gonna model the value just like everybody else models the value by multiplying it by a big probability by a big number called the value, which we don't know, but we're gonna pretend like we know that thing. And um, the question here is how are we gonna model this expected value? And we're gonna use classification. Um, it's one good way of doing it, not necessarily the only way. We're gonna separate this out, but then what are the classes in our classification problem? Basically, there are three classes. There's an impression, and a click, and a purchase, and using that expected value. How do we actually set this thing up? Um, we could use binary classification, and now we have a challenge. Well, what are the positives, what are the negatives? We could use multi-class classification, which is far more fancy than binary, or we could use regression and just figure out what the value is. Um, lots of very interesting things. We're going to pick binary classification because we only know how to do binary classification really well. So that's why we're going to pick it. Um, so what's the objective of binary classification? Well, it's to separate things. And we're going to assume that we can design a classifier that will come up with a score that will separate the classes. Okay, But what are the classes that we want to pick? Well, we could do like some people do and stick with clicks. We could stick with purchases. Um, we could do clicks versus purchases. I'm not sure. Um, lots of different combinations. So we have to pick something. Now what most people do is they pick one of these things. The most common one to pick is a click. Why? Well, there's, there's this an assumed structure that, well, if you get more clicks and people generally attribute purchases to clicks, then if you have more of them, you have a higher chance that there will be a purchase. And there's assuming that you know, there, these are this, there's a strong relationship between the purchase and the click. But what if that's not entirely true? What if there is a structure, but what if there's some sort of a nested structure, which in maybe optimizing for click is actually a bad idea for driving purchases? Could it be possible? Let's find out. So we tried this idea, and we trained uh, standard classification models to predict clicks versus impressions, purchases, versus impressions. And we tried this out with our offline logging data. And we found that, well, the clicks versus impression model did really good at predicting the clicks. Problem is, it was actually a lot worse than predicting uh, purchases than if we had just joined uh, a straightforward purchase prediction model. And that seems like an obvious thing, right? Because you know purchases are different than clicks. But then we tried to predict only purchases given impressions, and then we find out that was even worse at predicting the clicks. So that seems like an interesting problem. Um, so what's going on with that? Well, maybe that's just an, an issue. I mean, maybe predicting the purchases is the right thing to do because after all, a lot of those clicks don't lead to purchases, so we should just ignore them and maybe they're bad clicks and we don't really care. So let's run it anyway. So we ran it in an A-B test and we came up with, huh, it turns out that Actually, all the metrics went down, um, which is generally a bad thing in most places. Um, so maybe there's something funky going on. So we started to ask, why should we worry about whether this click score, because we had a good job at predicting clicks, why should we worry about it trying to predict the purchases? And you started to think, well, maybe binary classification isn't really a best idea here. Um, you know, Maybe we should think about something else. And so we thought, well, we don't want our click score to really predict purchases because after all, there can be fraudulent clicks and so forth. But like it or not, it's kind of important. And we started to think about ordinal regression. And in ordinal regression, there is this assumption that a single score can separate multiple classes, classes that are assumed to have a specific structure. 
namely that one class is better than another and that class is better than another and so forth. And so if we could design sort of an idealized structuring to these classes, they could put the clicks ahead of the impressions and the purchases ahead of the clicks. And now if we just had one score, it would rank everything very nicely. And now our click score would actually be used, would generally be used to predict purchases. Um, and there are other benefits to using this approach, namely that it's real simple to evaluate because it's just a simple model, uh, a single linear function, and it preserves the preferences that we had started up. So how do we do that? Well, again, uh, we only know how to do binary classification. So we turned our ordinal regression back into binary classification. And poof, that works really good. It turns out that it's very easy to do this. What you do is you just replicate your class many times. I didn't invent this technique. It existed uh, from some time ago. Um, but it's a very straightforward um, system. The only thing that you have to worry about is the fact that in advertising, our data sets are highly unbiased. Uh, sorry, sorry, unbalanced. And you have to balance them with some weights. And there's a way to do that. So basically what you're doing is at the end of this, you're going to get parallel hyperplanes. And those parallel hyperplanes will essentially solve two problems jointly at the same time. The first one will do impressions versus clicks and purchases, which is what most people think of when they think of clicks. And the second one will do impressions and clicks as the negative examples trying to predict the purchases. And since we are doing this jointly and we're replicating the data, the only difference between these two sets is an indicator variable here. So this works out uh, really well. Um, it's a little bit more expensive to train, but it has some benefits. So again, we, we did this comparison that we did earlier by looking at how well does this one model predict impressions um, versus clicks and impressions versus purchases. And it turns out that, you know, yes, it's not as good as if you just tried to predict clicks or just tried to predict purchases, but since we're really just trying to do both of these things, it turned out to be a really good compromise. Um, in the sense that it, it didn't degrade much on both of them. It's actually better for our purchases than we thought. So here is, is some plot, and we see that the, um, if you can't see it, the red line is the ordinal regression model, and the green line is, is the click, and then the uh, purchase. And so on the right-hand side, we're seeing how well does it predict clicks. And yes, the click model does really well, but the ordinal regression is not too bad. But the purchase model does very badly there. And similarly on the purchases side. So we're thinking, well, this seems like an interesting approach for ranking. But there's another problem, which is we don't just want to do ranking. You remember that we were calculating expected value with the probability in there. And so now we have this ranking score. How does it turn into a probability? And you might also be wondering, who cares about calibration and coming up with probabilities? Because after all, the world lives in second price auctions and everything's fine. Well, there are some issues with that. Um, firstly, advertising is not full of second price auctions, despite belief to the contrary. More and more of the world is turning into first price auctions, um, especially if you run a company that helps publishers. They love to charge first price auctions. Um, so you end up with a lot of issues. So for example, if your model is slightly uncalibrated and you are bidding a very high value, you're gonna be charged that high value and that could be very bad news. So it turns out that calibration tends to be uh, important. So how do we actually do it? Well, I've got more interesting things to say. I don't know. Um, there aren't very good techniques for calibration I mean, there are techniques that everybody uses and nobody questions them because there's just the three and they're all kind of the same. Um, so we tried all of those things and we noticed that everyone you could evaluate with log loss, you could do a weighted log loss, but then there's a question, how do you come up with the ground truth? How do you know that the probability is a specific score range is actually going to be the probability? It's hard to say. Um, there are other ways we could estimate this. But what we noticed was something very interesting, that if we just change the binning strategy just a little bit, we could improve the log loss by a pretty good margin, which seems pretty interesting to me, um, given that it was not that difficult to do. So it seems like there's a lot of future in calibration, and it's also quite possible that calibration is used as a specter to compensate for all sorts of things we don't understand. Um, that could be as well. Um, so coming to the end now, um, basically, we've come up with the idea that ordinal regression is a reasonably good strategy for ranking when you have these different nested objectives. 
Um, there are lots of different kinds of events that would fit into this approach. We talked about several different examples of conversion funnels. There's been evidence that they work in, in all those different applications. And we could talk about the halo purchases versus the exact purchases. There's viewability to, to be considered. There's lots of different ways that we could structure the interaction with ads. And I mean, it might be interesting to look into partial ordering to see if we could extend ordinal regression in this way. Um, yeah. So that's it. Uh, any questions?